Well, good morning and welcome to Woodland Community Church. Great to see some of you here in the building today and uh, thinking of those of you at home as well. Thanks for joining us. I just have a few announcements uh, to point out about the week coming up here. High school youth group is on tonight at the Bankies from 6.30 to 8.30 in their home in uh, Rib Lake. And the address is 970 West Street if you need that. But high school youth group tonight at 6.30. The middle school youth group this week will happen at uh, Jordan and Martha Scott's home on Stone Lake. Uh, there's going to be a scavenger hunt there. So middle school kids, you will not want to miss that. That's Wednesday night at 6.30 as well. Tuesday night is the ladies study at church here. That's still going on and been a great encouragement to many ladies. So Tuesday night, 6.30 here at the church. And then I know our lives have gotten a little busy again, some things starting up, but just a reminder that the Zoom meeting does still happen at noon, a uh, prayer meeting, uh, Monday through Friday, uh, Zoom at noon. Uh, you can join a pastor and other church members praying there. If you need that link, you can email the church and get that link. You know, one of the things that I think our church family appreciates about the Regeers is they embraced the Northwoods when they came. Would you say that? Yeah. I was just thinking, you know, firewood and falling trees, we've heard some of that. Uh, making maple syrup, they tackled that. Their family's still together. Chickens, and now I hear bees. So they are really uh, embracing the Northwoods and some of the, the fun that comes with it. And uh, this week, we checked in on another wooden, woodland family that is also into some bees, and I think you might learn something and enjoy getting to know them a little better. Brad! Good morning, Michael. What are you doing? <laughs> it's 7 o'clock in the morning. Time for some checking in. Let's go. Get some clothes on. <sighs> All right, here we go. <laughs> well, Brad... You're getting us up this early. We gotta grab some coffee and donuts. Oh, we can do that. So, Jesse, I'm not much of a coffee drinker. Do you guys have any tea? We do. Uh, we have an Earl Grey, uh, hot cinnamon sunset, and a vanilla. What do you think I should get? Oh, Brad? you sound like a hot cinnamon sunset guy. <laughs> All right, I'll go with the hot cinnamon. <laughs> okay, thank you, Jesse Cray. All right, guys, you have a good day. Thank you. Thank you. Good to see you. Oh man, it smells like hot cinnamon sunset in here. Oh man, it smells really good. Where are we going this morning? Well, Josh and Kara Ablin and family just moved into a new house in Ogama, and I thought we would go check in on them. They nearly doubled the population of Ogama when they moved in. <laughs> okay. All right, here we're at the Ablins. They got quite a nice landscape. And oh yeah. Oh, nice setup out here. I see them up there. Hey, Kara. Hi, Kara. Hi, All right. right. Hey, hey, welcome to Ogima. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we're glad we made it. Come on in. Good morning, guys. Okay, this is Miles. Hi, Miles. And James. All right, and there's Leah. All right, when we found out we're coming to Ogima, Pastor Michael asked, is there anything cool that happens in Ogima? Something cool about right in town here in Ogima is that the church plays bells every three hours during the day. Five times a day we get to hear beautiful hymns oh, cool. all over Ogama. Nice! Wow. Yeah. That's neat. <laughs> cool. Better than the nine o'clock siren. <laughs> I'm really, thanks Mom. for having us here this morning. Um, I, I'm sure many woodlanders maybe haven't um, met you guys yet. Maybe you could give us a little back history of, of um, woodland and how you guys ended up here again. <laughs> sure. I grew up in Woodland, um, so I really do consider it my home church. But we've been gone for eight years as the mm. Lord moved us to different places and then he brought us back and um, really enjoying being back to what really feels like home. Yeah, awesome. Cool. And, and what, what are you doing now that you're moved back up here? Well, now that we're moved back up here, I've been in the, in the shop with Mike Herenstein at nice. Four Springs. Right. So him and I are pulling things out of engines and putting them back in and switching them around and <laughs> turning it on and seeing if it fires up or not. So, <laughs> Looks like yeah. he's been having more of an influence on you Yeah, than just engines. <laughs> oh, right. okay, so the Ablins uh, have some honey for us to try. What am I supposed to do with this, Josh? Well, you, you dip it in there. Just dip it in there. Yeah. Okay. Oh, well. Don't be shy. Okay. okay. <laughs> Alright, yep, there you go. Oh, man, look at that. Alright, now be careful. Don't spill any on the table or you're going to have to lick it off because you don't want to waste it. <laughs> That's gold. Now do I just take a bite? Yeah, you, do just do? Take, you, you just take a bite of it. Just take a bite of it. <laughs> Alright. Mmm. <laughs> yep. Man, that's good. 
How do you how do you guys make this? Well, you know what? Let's show you. Suit up, James. Let's go. Let's All go. Right. Thanks for sharing your hunting. It's excellent. Yes. So, so what's God been teaching you and impressing on your hearts and minds lately? For me, the whole thing about worrying about tomorrow, the verse that says, don't worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Um, yeah, for me, that kind of redefines what that means, you know, to not worry about tomorrow because tomorrow could change and the you know, Lord could come tomorrow. Yeah. And so why am I worried about tomorrow, next week? Just be faithful to what the Lord has for me today mm -hmm. and to live up to that. So. And I think for me, too, um, the women's Bible study at church has been excellent, mm -hmm. very timely, um, that book, Anxious for Nothing. Mm -hmm. And so one of the verses that um, stuck out to me is First Peter 5, 7, cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Mm -hmm. And just knowing that we can trust in, um, trust in him completely for every day. And, uh, and he cares for us, and he cares for the little things. Sure. Okay, Kara, I was a camp staff kid. You were a camp staff kid, though you're so much younger than me. <laughs> yeah, I love growing up at camp, and um, just think it's really cool how the Lord brought us back, and now our kids can grow up as staff kids uh, in a new generation at mm -hmm. camp. Sure. So. You guys even met at camp. We did, yep. 2009? Yep, got married in 2011. Right here in Ogama. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Yeah. Josh, you sh shared earlier you were from Missouri, and that's the furthest north you had ever been. Yeah, Wisconsin. Yeah. So now I'm here, and it's cold, and <laughs> and it's it's good. We are thankful to be here, and we're excited, especially being a part of Woodland. It's neat to have you here. Yeah, for sure. Very cool. All right, Josh and Kara, thanks for letting us drop in this early morning. It's been a, a sweet visit. <laughs> nice. <laughs> it sure has. And that'll be an end to this week's edition of Woodlands Check It In. That was great, wasn't it? Checking in with uh, our family. I see the our Ogama residents are back there in the back. So hi, everybody. Good to see you. <laughs> well, welcome, welcome again to all you here this morning. Those of you that are on our live stream on Facebook, welcome as well. Glad you're here. Uh, let's let's stand together and, and worship. Praise praising our God this morning together. Praise is rising. Let's sing together. Praise is rising. See 
Good morning, everyone. Well, this morning we're going to be looking in James again um, and just going to be looking at what it means to have humility in our world. You know, humility is something that we don't naturally see around us, right? It's nothing that our our human natures naturally uh, generate, right? We need God's help in humility. Um, And Scripture also speaks about Christ being our example of, of humility. He is our greatest example of humility. And, and the greatest passage we see on this, I think, is in Philippians chapter 2. So if you've got your Bibles, turn with me to Philippians chapter 2. We're going to read from verse 2 through verse 11. And in here, we read about how our, our example is in Christ of humility. But not only do we see um, what humility looks like in Christ, we also see the result of humility in Christ and, and, and what, what we have in Christ because of his humility he has shown us and what he has worked through it. So we're in verse 2 of uh, Philippians chapter 2. I'm oh, sorry, verse 3. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only on his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. This is the God that we serve. This is the God that has set forth this example. And because of him being humbled and going to the cross, we can have salvation and we are exalted with him. And so let us go to this God who has come and humbled himself but is exalted above everything else. So Lord, we thank you. We thank you that you did not consider the heavens uh, to be something to gr- be grasped and hold on to, but, but you emptied yourself, you humbled yourself, and in humility, you came and you bore our sins. So, Lord, help us to recognize your humility and humble ourselves, Lord. Help us to be humble before you, knowing that we are nothing without you, or that you, we, are, we are dust. But because of what you have done for us and through us and in us, Lord, we can be exalted with you. And so, Lord, your name is above all things. 
above everything that's going on in our world. Lord, you supersede those things. You are above it. You reign in heaven. And so, Lord, th- we, we want to serve you. We want to follow you. We love you. And so, Lord, help us to keep our eyes fixed on you um, as, as we look to, to humble ourselves in this world so that you can exalt us by your side, Lord. And so, Lord, we, we thank you for who you are, how you've loved us, and we just ask that you'd lead us into worshiping you this morning. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Michael. Was, our, our next song, I think, de- describes uh, the character of God well, and it describes the, the strength and power of of our God, and, and he indeed has that, but it also describes him as, as a lamb, and that is something that we would maybe typify as something small and humble and, and unassuming, but our, our God is, is very not small and, and unassuming, and there's a lot of words and images that the Bible uses to describe our God, and, and I think sometimes our mind is blown and we realize a new aspect of God that we hadn't grasped before. And, and a God of the magnitude that we serve who, who is humble, is, if you just stop and think about that, why, why would he need to be or even want to be, but he is. And that's incredible because we don't desire that. I don't. Um, but uh, let's, let's sing together again. If you're able, let's stand together and um, sing the Lion and the Lamb. Coming on the clouds. Let's sing that together. He's coming on the clouds. King of kingdoms will bow down. And every chain will break. His broken hearts declare his praise. For who can stop the Lord Almighty? Our God is a lion, the lion of Judah. Roaring with power and fighting our battles, and every knee will bow before Him. Our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain for the sin of the world. His blood breaks the chains, and every knee. up the gates. Great question, a declarative statement here. We'll sing this together. Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Sing it again. Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord? Our God is the Lion, the Lion. Roaring with power and fighting our battles, every knee will bow before Him. Our God is a Lamb, the Lamb that was slain for the sin of the world. His blood breaks the chains, and death. 
every knee will bow before the lion and the lamb. Every knee will bow before the praises brothers and sisters so let your name be lifted higher be lifted higher be lifted higher so let your name be lifted higher be lifted higher be lifted higher so let your name Savior, I surrender all, all to Jesus. 
have a seat. Well, bless you, Tim and group. Thank you for leading us this morning. And it's great to see everybody. You have no idea how glad I am to see you on Sunday morning. This place is dark and empty during the week. And then you all come. And then you all leave. And then I spend the week walking around here with my Shepherd staff, wishing that you would come back, but praying for you, and then you do. And to those of you out on the stream, it's a blessing uh, to be seen by you and to know that you are with us as well. And I'm going to catch up to each of you uh, in time as well. Well, during the week, you should, you should know what goes on during the week here. It's not just dark and empty and inactive. We're actually having meetings and talking about the, uh, the, the school year ahead of us, and I'll mention here at the onset that one of the things we're doing is praying for our school system here in Rib Lake as big decisions are being made this week and in the early part of August about what school will look like, and we really and actually are praying for the school during noon, the, the 12 o'clock prayer time. Uh, let me or Alice know uh, if you'd like to join us for that prayer time, but during that time, we're praying for the school system, and, uh, and we also want to synchronize what we do here at Woodland uh, with the school system and also with camp. We want to work together as community organizations, um, but uh, you should know that we, we are making some plans, and it's, we're trying to hit a moving target here in our programming for children, youth, and adults, particularly with, with children. And we, we want to do things that are uh, COVID-proof and family-friendly. And what I mean by that is that if, if, in, if we end up sheltered in place or if things kind of move the wrong direction in the fall, and that could happen, we want to be teaching principles in our Discovery Land programming, for example, our Sunday morning time, principles that you could then take home and do at home or maybe with smaller co cohorts of people. And so no details right now about that, but that's, that's the way that we're thinking. The work of discipleship goes on and is not dependent on COVID. Amen? 
It, it really isn't. And there are certain things that we need to be doing anyway, and we need to be gathering up our little platoons, our little cohorts of people, and serving the Lord together and teaching uh, particularly our children about what it looks like to love and serve the Lord Jesus. And so that's, that's the direction that we're thinking, and we'll have some more uh, details about that uh, in the future. Uh, we're in James 4 this morning. James 4, verse 11, going to go all the way through verse 6 of chapter 5. And I'll give you a second to find that passage in your Bibles. And then I, I feel prompted to ask the Lord to open our hearts, minds, and eyes this morning. Uh, because this is a passage that we could really tee off on. I mean, we could, we're going to look at it in three sections. There's three particular sections that flow together. And any one of these sections, we could just talk for hours and hours about. And we could talk for hours and hours about society and culture and government and politics and all this stuff because we're talking about the way that our life as a church family intersects with the world and what humility has to do about that. And so some of, the, some of the application is pretty obvious. We don't want to tee off on all these ideas, but these, these things we're talking about are, are fraught with difficulty, and it's totally relevant. I mean, there's times when I'm looking at God's Word here, typically in the building, but also at home, and I just kind of tear up because I'm like, Lord, you knew where we'd be at like 2,000 years ago when this is written. These things are totally current and totally relevant uh, to where we are. James is a fresh, living book because God's Word, God's Spirit is ministering His Word to our hearts. Let's pray together. Father, thank You for this passage that is right what we need to hear today. Right where we are at culture, in culture, right where we are as a society, right where we are as a community, right where we are as families and individuals. Help us, Lord, to come to these words with hearts that are open and eyes that are open so that we could recognize your work in our lives and where we have closed up our hearts, where we've gotten angry maybe, and we don't want to hear words of instruction, then would you have mercy on us? Would you thaw our stony hearts or open our stony hearts and make them soft so that we might respond to your word. Help us with this, Lord. Thank you for being so gentle with us, and help us to be gentle with the people around us. We love you and pray this in your name. Amen. James is about faith bearing spiritual fruit in the midst of hardship. That's what the whole book is about. That's why it's such a relevant letter for us. We're in the final section of James now, which is about spiritual fruit in the sight of the watching world. The things that we're, we're doing as a result of this passage are things that we need to be doing as God's people together, but then that needs to spill out into our interaction with everybody else in society, whether they know the Lord or not. James typically has a pattern. He'll, he'll introduce a subject, and then he'll deep dive into the different component parts of that subject. Last week... Uh, we talked about saving faith before the watching world and what it looks like, and it looks like humility before God. Verse 10, chapter 4, humble yourselves before the Lord and he will exalt you. James knows that we haven't gotten it right, that at different places we, we haven't been humble with God. We've clung to our own way. We've wanted to do our own thing. And he now shows us what it looks like to confess our sins before him, to be humble before God. And then that humility with God is going to spill over into our relationships with other people. First the church, right? the household hold of God, our church families, and then the watching world. So a good question that we could ask would be, how do we act with humility in the world? How do we act with humility in the world? And the Hopkins ladies have memorized this great big long passage. They did it together. And let's watch them as they recite this passage together. 
hand to anyone. Anyone who speaks against their brothers or sisters or judges them, just speaks against the law and judges it. When you judge the law, you are not keeping it, but sitting in judgment on it. There is only one lawgiver and judge, the one who is able to save and destroy. But you, who are you to judge your neighbor? Now listen, you who say, today or tomorrow, we will go into this or that city. Spend a year there, carry on business, and make money. Why, you do not even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if it is the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogant schemes. All such boasting is evil. If anyone, then, knows the good they ought to do and doesn't do it, it is a sin for them. Now listen, you rich people. Weep and wail because of the misery coming upon you. Your wealth has rotted, and moths have eaten your clothes. Your gold and silver are corroded. Their corrosion will testify against you and eat your flesh like fire. You have hoarded wealth in the last days. Look, the wages you failed to pay the workmen who mowed your fields are crying out against you. The cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord Almighty. You have lived on earth in luxury and self-indulgence. You have fattened yourselves in the day of slaughter. You have condemned and murdered innocent men who were not opposing you. I'm not sure that cat actually memorized that passage. I think that cat was reading. But way to go, Hopkins women. That was a long passage. Yeah. Way to hang with it when the memory work gets hard. Full marks. Thank you so much to the, the Hopkins for that. How do we act with humility in the world? This passage in three parts deals once again with speech. Do you think speech is important to James? I think so. Speech, human endeavors, or what we might call planning, and then also with justice, which is something that we've talked about plenty in our society lately. How do we act with humility in the world? First part, verses 11 and 12. Not with slanderous speech, but with an appeal to God's word. Not with slanderous speech, but an appeal to God's word. Don't tear other people down with speech. That's the basic idea of these verses. Don't tear other people down. Do not speak evil against one another, brothers. James says, don't use inflamed speech to destroy people. Properly speaking, technically this is called slander. If you write something, you use inflamed speech, you tear somebody down in writing, that's called libel. It's basically the same thing, and you know how it works. Somebody hears something he doesn't like, and then rather than reason out a response, he creates a category and dumps the other person in it. Oh, you're just one of those blankety blank people. Blankety blank doesn't have to be a swear word. It's just a category. You're one of those people. Or you're just a terrible, awful, horrible, no good person. All right? It has nothing to do with the argument that you're making. You're just creating this category and destroying the person in order to uh, make your argument, which you really aren't doing. In, uh, in, in, uh, rhetorically, this is called an ad hominem argument, right, Mrs. Roosh? You make a personal attack on a person to make your argument, and the only thing you really accomplish is to put everybody on edge emotionally, and nothing really gets fixed. Have we ever heard of speech like this? Okay, no reason to state the obvious. All right, James's problem with this 
is, is not just that it's nasty and ugly and unproductive, which it is, but that when we do this, we're actually putting ourselves in God's place. That's James's problem with this. Last part of verse 11, the one who speaks against a brother or judges his brother speaks evil against the law and judges the law. Notice he's starting here with the household of God. Judgment begins with the household of God, Peter says. All right, get this right in the church, and then you'll have something to say to people who are outside the church. The law here, he's talking about the law of Moses. This is the Old Testament law. Remember how Jesus interacts with the Old Testament law. He summarized it. He fulfilled it with his perfect life. And then he reapplied the moral aspects of the law to his new covenant people. So Jesus says, Matthew 22, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment, and a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. In other words, Jesus boils down the whole law and says, when you you first love God, then love other people, you have, in essence, kept the law of God. And we're able to do this only because Jesus kept the law for us. James says, if you really fulfill, this is chapter 2, verse 8, if you really fulfill the royal law, that's the new covenant law as applied by Jesus. According to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You are doing well. So it's really, really important to love people through constructive speech that builds people up and not with slander. Well, if not with slander, then what? I mean, is James saying that we're just supposed to avoid taking on problems? and addressing and correcting things going on in other people's lives? Not at all. He's not saying that at all. Rather, this is verse 12, we're to measure everything by the standard of God's word. Verse 12, there's only one lawgiver and judge, he who is able to save and to destroy, but who are you to judge your neighbor? In other words, it's not your job to judge other people, but you can hold them up to God's word for the purpose of instruction. There's one lawgiver, one judge, and one executive of the law. That's God. Let God do his work in other people's lives. Now, I I have known people who say things like, uh, Bible says not to judge, so don't judge me. In fact, don't correct me. In fact, don't, don't disagree with me. In fact, don't do anything that sets me emotionally on edge because the Bible says uh, not to judge. Just let me be the person that I am and do my own thing. Um, That has a wrong feel to it, doesn't it? And that's because that's not at all what the Bible tells us to do. In fact, the the whole book of Proverbs talks about the fool. We're to spend, we're to discern as we look at other people what foolish behavior is. And we're to avoid the fool. Don't hang out with that guy. Uh, We're to constantly to discern who to trust in buying and selling. We do that all the time, right? You get on the line, you're buying something, you're thinking, is this safe? You're making judgments. Uh, In the church, when we appoint leaders, particularly elders, there are lists in 1 Timothy 3 and Titus 1 about that that list characteristics that are to be true of elders in the church. So we are making discernments. We are making judgments. We are making evaluations. Uh, In the political sphere, when we elect leaders, we should choose leaders who are morally qualified for the job. We have evaluations uh, to make. But what we're doing when we do this is that we're appealing to God's word. We're not standing above God's word and destroying people for the sake of getting our point across. So we think. We're, We're holding up God's word, remembering that God's word always builds people up, even when God is announcing judgment. It's always constructive, always for the purpose of encouragement and reconciliation. We need to be gentle with people, but rigorous with ideas. That's one of my very favorite sayings. 
We, there's lots of things to correct. But let's be gentle with people and but rigorous with ideas. All right? Not with slanderous speech. That's how we're, we're not to interact in the world with slanderous speech, but with God's word. That's the first that's the first mark of humility in the world. Secondly, verses 13 to 17, a well-known part of this passage. Not with presumptuous plans, but with an appeal to God's will. Not with presumptuous plans, but an appeal to God's will. So you have these guys, and this is, this is humorous. You picture these two guys who I guess they're starting a business. And this is not a bad thing to do. It's not bad to start a business. It's not bad to make plans. It's not bad to go out and do things. But you look at these two guys. I mean, they're, they're saying, yeah, we're going to go here, and we're going to go there, and we're going to make a little money, and we might do it today, or we might do it tomorrow. We've got possibilities, man. We've got a contingency plan. We've got a plan that in, could include everything that might happen. James says you're forgetting some things. If this is the way that you boast and brag, in his words, you're forgetting some things. First of all, your lack of foreknowledge. You do not know what tomorrow may bring. Is that not obvious to us? More obvious to us now than it was a year ago. Now we're even afraid to make plans because we do not know what tomorrow may bring. It's not a bad lesson. We don't have foreknowledge. Second thing these guys are forgetting is the brevity and frigidity of life. In other words, life is fragile. What is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. I'm amazed at life increasingly, how short life is. You're a child. People take care of you. Then you're an older child. They still kind of take care of you. Then you're a young adult, and you get married, and somebody takes care of you. As a joke. Uh, you have a few years in the middle of your life where you're productive and you seem like you can do things, and then you start to forget everything. You can't remember where you put things. How fleeting and short is life. James says, don't forget it. Life is brief. Life is fragile. And then finally, and this is really where James is driving here, you're forgetting God's will that might include something you haven't thought of. God is actually thinking things that you haven't thought of. How about that? We have this little exercise in our family. We do it every three months, and we're talking about doing it even more. I don't even know what to call it, but I'll just tell you what it is, and maybe you want to try it. It's kind of fun. We get together as a family, and we list out on a piece of paper or in a journal that we keep our do's, our don'ts, and our dreams. Do's, don'ts, dreams. Really simple, three D's, you can remember it. We did this before COVID. We did this before the summer. Do's are just like to-do's, like sh a shopping list of things that we want to do, like we need to finish that fence around the blueberries so the birds don't get the blueberries. You know, we need to move the beehive, which you can only do 12 inches at a time. So that means you've got to shift it every time you look at the bees. I mean, it's just, these are just to-do things. All right, so we list out all those things. And then we talk about don'ts. These are negative trends that we want to address. Like, let's stop eating cereal out of the cupboard between meals all the time. No more <laughs> this. It's just, it's not, an, it's not a moral issue, but we're just, we need to stop that for different reasons. All right, don'ts. And then we have dreams, and everybody gets to pitch in. These are our dreams. These are things we want to do, things we want to, places we want to go, uh, projects we want to do, things we want to, we want to learn. It's lots of fun. And then, very critically, we pray about this. And we remember that we don't even know what's going to happen tomorrow, especially during COVID. And, and we just, we have no idea. And so, Lord, just take this list. This is what's on our hearts. Bless what you want to bless and then put stuff on this list that we're supposed to do or not supposed to do or dream that we hadn't even thought of. It's a great little exercise as a family that lets us be like this 
Let's just be open-handed before God. This really is an appeal to God's will. Uh, Notice James just has one verse that says what we ought to do. He says, instead, you ought to say, if it is the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. If it's the Lord's will. Now, I I don't think this means that we have to be neurotic in our talk. I've known people who can't make a positive statement without saying, if it is the Lord's will. I'm going to go get a sandwich if it is the Lord's will. I might order the Coca-Cola if it's God's will, or maybe the Dr. Pepper if it's God's will. It's an exaggeration. They were almost this bad. Um, I don't think we need to be nervous about this. This is more about our demeanor toward God. Uh, But it does mean we need to hold our plans loosely, yield them to God. He has something, he might have something better that he's going to do. And we don't have to look far to come up with an example for this. Do you remember last year as a church family here at Woodland what we were talking about? Do you remember? Can you even think back to summer of 2019, summer of baseball and normal stuff, we were actually talking about adding on to the building. Can you even remember that? I forget that sometimes. And then every once in a while when that idea comes to my mind, I'm like, I am so glad that we did not start blowing out walls and adding on to the building given where we are right now. We don't need to be in the middle of a building project. But it wasn't just that. We were, we were adding programs. We were doing stuff with children, youth, and adults. We were talking about uh, taking on an intern for children's ministry. And it's all great stuff. And I don't think we were the least bit wrong to want to do those things. But you know what God said? He said, uh-uh. I'm going to do something else in your church family. And I still don't know what that is. We're watching, aren't we? But we know there's certain things that we need to be doing, and it doesn't apparently include those things. And, and God can do that, and it's all positive when he does this stuff. Let's make and hold our plans lightly. What else does humility look like in the world, or how shall we act with humility in the world? Final section of the passage. This gets into chapter 5, first six verses of chapter 5. This is one of those places where the chapter divisions don't serve us very well. Um, But we are to act in the world with humility, not with indulgent injustice to the poor, but with an appeal to God's judgment. Not with an indulgent injustice to the poor, but with an appeal to God's judgment. And here we could really spend like a week and a couple months talking about how this is all playing out in society. But James makes some things pretty clear here. There's two groups of people in these six verses. There is people of means, people of influence, people of power. And in James's context, these people were unrighteous. Doubtless he's addressing a particular situation that was going on in the first century church. Uh, There's also people without means who in James's context were righteous. They were seeking God. Now you could have people of means who are righteous and people without means who are unrighteous. That's entirely possible, but those aren't the people James is talking about right here. People of means who are unrighteous. Your riches have rotted. Your garments are moth-eaten. Gold and silver are corroded. You have laid up treasure in the last days. This is a view from the end. From the, from the vantage point of when Jesus returns and our whole lives are laid out before God. And we see not only the stuff that we've collected, but the stuff that has driven our hearts. What we've loved and what we've spent time on. This is a picture of true reality of, as God sees it when we're asked to give an account of our lives. And to these people who have means and power and influence and who have abused other people, James says, weep and howl for the miseries that are coming on you. I cannot validate this, 
but I, am, I have been told by one of you, actually, and uh, Kim Probst, if you're out there or there, I want to talk to you about whether pigs actually do this. But I am told that when a pig runs at a hot wire, the pig will actually start squealing before it hits the wire. Right? Pigs are both brilliant and stupid at the same time. So here's this, you know, 300-pound pig or whatever, even bigger, running at this hot wire and squealing, squealing, goes through the wire. The pig knows what's going to happen. Right? The analogy breaks down because God's judgment is not a hot wire that you could run through. But what James is saying is start squealing now. If you are, have means and you have abused people, go ahead and start the squealing like a pig because the day of judgment is coming. And verses 4 to first part of verse 6, we see how these people of means have treated other people. The wages of the laborers who mowed your field which you kept back by fraud are crying out against you. The cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. You have lived on the earth in luxury and in self-indulgence. You fattened your hearts in the day of slaughter. That's what you've done. Then he talks about people without means who are righteous, not because they're poor. Let's get that straight. You're never righteous just because you're poor. That's not a New Testament picture at all. You're righteous because you trust God. And these people, these, the, the, the poor who, have been, who are disadvantaged here are calling out to God. They work. They cry out to the Lord Notice that they do not resist their oppressor. Why? Because they can't, doubtless, but also because they know that they have an advocate in God and the day of justice is coming. This is a fascinating passage to read right now in culture because James doesn't, he doesn't tell the poor to take to the streets, doesn't tell them to stand up for their rights, though the poor have rights, we have rights. He doesn't tell us to change the government, though that is sometimes possible. He simply observes that the hope of righteous people is in God. Whatever else you do about injustice, you've got to start there if you want meaningful change. So I, I, I've got questions, and we'll take just a few minutes to think about this. W what does this look like for us in a digital age? Uh, there's, there's a couple of principles and then some applications, and we're done here. Um, in our culture, things look a little bit different for us, right? I mean, we are more classless and fluid in culture than they were in the first century. So think about all of us. At different times, we hire different people to do things, all right? And we don't, we don't do this because we're rich, probably any of us, but just in, in, in living in society, we hire people to do individual jobs, and that gives us a kind of influence, and we are able to do this because we have means, but at the same time, we're working for different people. So, like, which group are we in? Well, it, it, it doesn't really matter in our setting. <laughs> we need to remember, regardless of whether we're hiring people or working for people, that people matter to God. That's the overriding principle of this part of the passage. People matter to God, and we're going to be judged one day on how we have treated people, particularly if we know the Lord Jesus. So here's, here's a couple of applications. People matter, and there's, there's time to reconcile relationships. People matter, and there's time to reconcile relationships. James doesn't talk this way because it's like game up and you can't do anything about it. Whenever James or any of the biblical authors uh, say these things like weep and wail and start squealing now and woe to you and stuff like that, it's because there's still time to change. 
All right, until you die or until Jesus physically and actually comes back, there is time to do things to make this right. God has put all of us into places of influence within our spheres of influence. We can't change the world no matter what we think, no matter what we go on and like or sign on the internet. You can't individually change the world, but every one of us has a sphere of influence, and we need to make sure that the people that God has entrusted to us are taken care of. So, you know, how are you? How is your family? Uh, are, are, you, are you being taken care of? Is there anything that you want to talk about with somebody else? Uh, our culture is in turmoil right now because we're expecting institutions, schools and government in particular, to do things that it was never intended to do. Government way too big to do all the things that it wants to do. Any school is too big to do things that should be done at home. That stuff isn't going to break, but or isn't going to work. But you know what? As, as an individual church family and in our different spheres of influence, we can care for people. It's not a top-down thing. It's a, it's a bottom-up thing. Uh, we can, because people matter, we can reconcile relationships when that needs to happen. Second application, then we're done. People matter, and I need to use my means to care for people. God has given all of us something to use in order to care for other people because people matter. So we use words. Take time to empathize with people. I don't know what's going to happen this fall, but I think all of us know it's going to be hard, right? With the amount of uncertainty that we're dealing with, people are really going to be on edge. How are you doing? I need to empathize with people. How are you getting along? Is there anything I can help you with? Everybody is being besieged by other people who want them to do certain things. Let's listen to other people. And then our demeanor, all right? Whether we wear masks or not or gather in certain places or not, we're going to have to do this without anger and to show that we care for people. Use means to remind people, above all, that they're made in God's image. And you know what? If we love people that way, it's going to be a whole lot easier to tell them the reason for the hope that is within us. Amen. Isn't James relevant? Yep. Doesn't he have things to tell us right now about where we're at in society? He certainly does. Lord, thank you for this word from you. Um, application is a community endeavor. We we, you, you've given us this word not to be done with it this morning, but to start talking about it during the week with all the people that we meet, especially brothers and sisters in you. Help us to, to look at these verses and, and talk about what it looks like to act with humility in the world. Give us ideas that haven't even occurred to us this morning and help us to hold plans loosely and uh, to love other people in your name. We need your help to do it. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Brian. Uh, a popular song right now that maybe, maybe you've heard on the radio by Danny Gokey talks about how complicated we sometimes make life and how complicated life is, and the song basically boils it down to love God and love people. Anybody heard that one? Um, I think... We need to boil it down to loving God and love people a little more. Don't you think? Uh, that was a great charge, Pastor Brian, from the Word of God. Thank you. Let's stand, if you're able to, and sing a, a closing song this morning. We're not singing that song, by the way. We're singing, we're singing a different song this morning. <laughs> Sorry about that.
Romans 15 out of here. This is Paul's charge to the Romans that reminds us about what we're all about. He says, now to him who is able to strengthen you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery that was kept hidden for long ages, but now has been disclosed and through the prophetic writings has been made known to all nations according to the command of the eternal God, to bring about the obedience of faith to the only wise God be forever through Jesus Christ. Amen. He is the one we're serving all week and forever. Have a great week in the Lord, and we'll see you again soon.